Hello everyone, I'm Nathaniel Salazar and I'll be presenting on The Limits of Steganography, written by Anderson and Pentacolas. The paper itself is a survey on steganography back in 1998. It provides a theoretical framework to define steganography and possible limitations. So I'll be taking their work and providing a modern context featuring progressions on the techniques referenced and usage of those techniques as of recording, which is um, the year 2021. More specifically, I'll start by defining key terms and a brief history that was also highlighted in the paper, then introduce the prisoner's problem, the basic setup for steganography, the modern application of steganography, and end with the author's approach to theoretical limits using entropy and what the future holds for this specific topic. So first, what is steganography? To put it simply, it's concealing the existence of a message from any third party that may be listening onto our channel. This is a key distinction from cryptography, as cryptography aims to just conceal the contents of the message, as shown with the encryption on the bottom right. The image I grabbed from the site below provides a good example of segmentography in the context of images. Here, to the average viewer, they would see a picture of the Mona Lisa. The colors look identical, the form is the same, there isn't anything that would indicate there is something beyond just a picture of the Mona Lisa. But to a sender and recipient who are communicating using hidden messages and images, they can look at the least significant bits of each pixel to get the intended message, so long as both parties are aware to look for them. We'll cover more about this technique and others in the usage section. There have been several instances of steganography used in the past, such as Chinese code endograms and European grill systems, but the most famous case was back in 1586 with Mary Queen of Scots and the Babington plot. While she was in prison, Mary Queen of Scots conspired with her followers to assassinate Queen Elizabeth of England through letters. Along with the cipher presented here, the second article relies on the fact that a seemingly benign postal letter was swapped with the conspirators' instructions with a replacement seal thus concealing any evidence of the letter being tampered with. They are eventually caught when one of the letters was sloppily distributed and landed in the hands of the policeman. It's a great story for more of the narrative. I recommend reading the code book by Simon Singh that presents topics like these in the historical vignettes. Today, when we think of psychonography, some may think of popular AR or augmented reality games using those techniques. But a common trend is the malicious use of psychonography with the prolific spread of social media. I grabbed some articles detailing these attacks with some dating back as early as October 2020. I won't go into detail with these attacks, but I do want to highlight that most of these use techniques that existed at the time of this paper, which is 1998. The malicious memes headline used Twitter as the delivery of the exploit. Victims would interact with the infected image, and the code that was embedded in the image would communicate with other malware, such as printing screenshots of the infected machines and sending it across the web. The embeddings themselves can potentially be used using can potentially be done using LSB, which I introduced in slide four and recovered briefly in the paper. In short, steganography has been a prevalent technique and can be maliciously abused, so it's important to get a theoretical basis of this field and see what the ceiling is for steganography. If you were to break down the setup for steganography and abstract its individual components, we are then presented with the prisoner problem. Here, there are two prisoners trying to communicate, Alice and Bob. They have this secret message M they want to share, such as planning to kill the queen. They need to sneak this message past the warden that is monitoring the communication between Alice and Bob for any foul play. So what Alice and Bob decide to do is conceal the message into an image or audio and use a secret key K to extract M from their seemingly benign communication. So Alice takes a cover object C, such as an ob image of the Mona Lisa, and embeds M into C using the secret key K. This creates what we call a stego object, marked S. The stego object has the appearance of our cover image while harboring our message to kill the queen, which is M. So then S is sent on its channel the warden is listening on, but the warden cannot detect the secret message just by viewing the communication. So Bob receives S and is able to extract the secret message using the previously agreed key, which was K. Steganography hinges on the fact that the warden cannot detect our secret message through various embedding techniques. Regardless of the cover objects, which can be an image or audio, how we decide on the creation of our stego object determines success for the prisoner's problem. With the underlying basis of the prisoner's problem, we can also present variations to the setup by changing how the warden observes this communication between Alice and Bob. 
With a passive warden, the warden is simply listening onto the channel. They read through the traffic logs and detect if there's any anomalies present. However, at best, the passive warden simply notifies the user that there is something suspicious here, but doesn't actively remove such a message. Most systems utilize this setup, but they can also take on the form of an active warden. An active warden is considered a subset of passive warden warden in the sense that on top of detecting the sego object they also have the ability to remove and filter out any message that could have any convert message so marking systems such as the ones that detect if piracies here or copyrights being used um, is would be considered more of an active warden we briefly mentioned the use or rather abuse of steganography in the history section through the use of malware and attacks but steganography does have a use case that is rather benign the primary usage is in the realm of copyright and verifying authenticity. There are two subsets that the paper discusses, and they are fingerprinting and watermarking. Fingerprinting is where a separate mark are embedded in the copies of the object to act as a hidden serial number, identifying users if they decide to break the agreement of the software or property they are using. Watermarking, on the other hand, are all marked the same and act as a hidden signature by the company that the company retains ownership and it should not be copied. Think of like stock images and stuff like that. Um, I also want to note that in this case, um, the case of copyright in general, that they have a slightly different setup than what's presented in the prisoner's problem and in typical malicious attacks. In this case, all parties are aware of a marking, possibly even having one that's visible, like in the case of stock images. So th then if you're parroting a content um, the success in this case would be a full removal of such a mark. A malicious actor would then be acting as an active warden, trying to remove the mark that's hidden in the Stego object. Some state-of-the-art the authors present back in 1988 focus on the two mediums of images and audio to embed their secret messages. For images, we have using the least significant bit and even using a key. For the case of LSB, we simply get the least significant bits of the pixel to form a message, as shown from the Mona Lisa picture from earlier. Adding on to LSB, if we have a predefined key stream to work with, we can also select the pixels for our message based on the bits of the key given. The main challenges presented here for images are matters of construction and possible loss. Some pixels may be unsuitable for modification because alterations are more visibly noticeable, like in the case of monochrome images. So a solution is having a guidelines for making sure changes in luminosity in the surrounding pixels are at a certain middle ground to avoid detection. In the case of an active warden or in a lossy medium, some of the bits in our stego object could also be lost in transmission. And there, it's possible that the secret message that's embedded in our image could also be lost as well. So we introduce some redundancy to our secret message through the use of error correcting codes or various algorithms such as a patchwork algorithm that injects copies of our message in additional pixels. For embedding our message in audio, we can also do similar techniques with a keystream to select which sound samples to select for our message based on the bits of the key. A technique unique to audio is the usage of masking. Masking is where one sound interferes with our perception of another sound. Given two tones of similar frequency, the louder tone will mask the quieter one. This technique is seen in tinnitus masking to suppress the high-pitched sound associated with hearing loss. So with compression, they also use this concept of masking to save space, but it can exploit it such that we can place our hidden information just below the threshold of perception. While we run the risk of losing data during the compression process, employing similar redundancy techniques as seen in the previous slide ensures the integrity of our message. So for this section, I wanted to highlight modern tools that can be used to create the Stego objects themselves. This particular tool is called Steghide and was expecting a more complicated process to use it. But looking at a brief tutorial that I'll link in the description, it was a very simple tool to use. In this particular example, I'm hiding the text, this is secret information in a picture of Mario. Steghide was able to embed and extract the same information given the password, it's a me. In this case, EF is the embedded file, CF is our cover file, SF is our stego file, and XF is our extractive file. We can confirm that our stego file mario underscore sf.jpg has the hidden information contained in it because of the increase in size, as we can see in the right there. I also did this with an audio file as well, as the syntax for in steghide is the same for both. 
In short, there is no noticeable difference between the original cover text and the psycho object generated, unless inspected further as seen from this analyzing the size. StegHide also supports encryption to further conceal the information hidden in the Stego file, and the program itself is accessible for the price of free on all platforms. If you're curious about the implementation details, it is also an open source uh, project, so you can view the particular embedding instruction process they utilize with StegHide in the Git repo. If you also would prefer a more graphical experience, here is a short list of other free tools that are readily available to the public with variations on how they embed and extract files. This accessibility highlights the closing gap between the techniques I highlighted earlier and commercial use, as someone who is inexperienced with steganography can utilize tools to do it for them. You know, at the time of writing the paper back in 1998, the same techniques such as LSB and masking highlighted there are now manifest in these products for more ease of use. On the flip side, as someone acting in the role of the warden, there is also tools to detect the presence of this secret information. Tools such as Steg Expose and Stegalize can help detect this information by looking at hex dumps or general patterns in the files. General forensic analysis deals with this detection and often involves trained operators to also manually detect these features. So then a natural question that the authors wanted to cover in the title of this paper is, what is the limitation of steganography? In other words, what is the theoretical ideal if there is one? The equivalence of this would be the one sign patent cryptography, which provides unconditional secrecy. We're aiming for unconditional convertness to create this concept called a secure stego system. To quote the authors, it is where the wording cannot differentiate between raw cover text and the stego text. If you put them side by side, comparing the two files, you would find no faults even after attempting a variety of keys. The warden itself can be assumed to be a probabilistic polynomial Turing machine and has seen previous attempts of this embedding to know what an innocent plain text should look like. To get to the main answer, there isn't a clear ideal to strive for, as it would be rather impossible to create such a stego object without perfect conditions. However, the author proposed multiple ways to prove this limitation, and I'll first start off by utilizing basic information theory, which is in this case entropy. Entropy is a concept developed by Claude Shannon and is the amount of uncertainty involved in the value of a random variable. A high entropy of 1 would indicate every event has equal probability, while a low entropy of 0 would indicate impossibility or uncertainty. A good example would be a fair coin would have a high entropy, which is a, while a biased coin that favors head, for instance, would have a very low entropy. In this case, we compare the information of random data to the material to be embedded, which is strictly additive. So for our definition that the authors present, the entropy of the stego object S equals the entropy of the cover object C plus the entropy of the embedded material E, or the secret message M if you want to use the same um, naming scheme. This makes sense because any information we add onto the cover text would also be present in the generated stego object. With this entropy definition in mind, the clear goal is to make it such that the entropy of the stego text is relatively close to entropy of the cover text. This can be done by reducing the entropy of the embedded message or process the cover text such that it makes up the difference of the embedded message's entropy. The authors don't explicitly state that we could have the entropy of the stego text in the cover text to be strictly equal, as I believe it may fall into the realm of possibility, but this could be potentially be a open question for further proof in the future. The major problem that an attacker would need is to solve is to how effectively the opponent is able to measure this entropy of the cover text compared to a ground truth. However, since we continue to give the more and more stego text, the better the warden may be able to estimate the statistics of the underlying cover text. So we'll assume they do have unpredictable power, as authors put it. In short, we can attempt to create stego objects that keep its entropy close to the entropy of the cover text originated from to create the secure stego system and avoid detection from the warden. Additional attempts the authors use to explain the limitations are listed here on this slide. First, the concept of perfect compression, which is an ideal such that the information source is compressed to the point that there is no redundancy left. This is fine for regular information theory, but has a strange effect in steganography. This setup makes it such that the compressed objects would be dense in the set of bit strings of the same length, and Alice could hide any arbitrary ciphertext and run it through this perfect decompressor. This makes any compressed medium that has hidden information exactly the same to anyone else, as that information is like decompressed to zero. 
The problem with this is it's not rigorous enough, rigorous enough for realistic for steganography, as such a decompressor would realistically decompress a random bit of length n. This Perfect compression is brought up to show that typical conventions of information theory don't translate well when applying it to steganography. The authors also discuss the concept of a selection channel, which mirrors Shannon's correction channel, where both received and transmitted signals can be viewed to allow for bit corrections. This inspired the authors to create the selection channel, which is a shared one-time pad such that Alice and Bob communicate across bits and pieces of this medium. The example they give is a book cipher, which is presented below. Certain coordinates of the book are passed back and forth to form words and sentences that make up the secret message. With this selection channel in mind, the authors then argue this power of power parity, which in short explains that the possible Stegel's text is limited by the choice of the selection channel. This makes sense as there is less material to work with and the less likely they are able to form coherent and plausible cover text. This then places the upper bound of useful information that can be used to hide our secret message. And finally, the authors bring up equivalence classes, such as synonyms in this case. If we were to replace a message with corresponding synonyms, such as can to able to, if the recipient is aware of these synonym pairs ahead of time and has a reference of the original message, we can form messages from these replacements of the synonym pairs. This opened up the area of natural language processing, which studies how a computer can generate human-like sentences. So then a subset of this um, NLP would be applying these techniques to steganography, where we can embed a ciphertext using natural lang language processing, which is coined as the Stego Turing test. Discussion suggests that this concept of equivalence classes presents an additional upper bound of the stego channel capacity on the difference between lossy and lossless compression, as a selection of cover text of an equivalence class needs to be equal to avoid such loss. Moving on to related and future work, the authors present this concept of public key steganography. Similar to public key cryptography, instead of a shared secret key between Alice and Bob, the stego object and the key are sent on the same channel. In the first draft of this paper, the authors proposed a public key steganography scheme against a passive warden. In this scheme, it assumed that Alice can modify one out of k bits without the warden noticing the changes. Thus, Alice can fool the warden by encoding a message within this bit stream that is available to everyone. If Bob has a public key that is known to Alice, Alice will simply encrypt using that public key and embed it as the parity of successive blocks. Other parties can view this information, but only Bob will be successful in reading Alice's message. In this previous draft, they were unsure how public key steganography could operate under an active warden that can modify a bit in every k bits, just like Alice. So with the current paper, they revisit this concept and propose a similar key scheme. In this scheme, Alice chooses a short one-time key that selects some permutation of the cover text bits and then hides the message as the parity of successive k tuple of bits in this permutated sequence. Despite the active warden's ability to modify the bits, not all the bits are affected. Once that message has been sent encrypted using Bob's public key, the one-time key that Alice created is sent on the same channel. The argument is that since this communication is open to everyone, the active warden won't know either the message or the key was intended for Bob, so they can evade detection there. While it is an interesting workaround for both the passive and active warden, I personally think that the circumstances presented here were a little generous, even without factoring a lossy medium where there could be bits that still dropped at random. The authors themselves also comment that it is leading toward contrived circumstances and highlight that these schemes are more an existence proof than practical engineered solutions. I tried viewing current attempts at this problem and haven't come across anything too noteworthy, although I have seen some theory and simple implementations that toy with this idea. My favorite one is applying the concept of elliptic curves into this, such that we choose various pixels in this image based on an elliptic function. If you're interested in more details, I've referenced this paper and more at the end of this bibliography. As mentioned in the theory section, there was a brief proposal of using natural language processing in the field of steganography. While the concept of a stego Turing test hasn't been fully realized, I did come across a semi-automated embedding scheme that takes these principles in a new light. The implementation Hide As You Type is a command line tool that creates a secret message using the user's input of sentences. Instead of using the equivalence classes as seen earlier, the hash is maintained to ensure that the secret message can be found by using the sentence provided. 
This program creates two text files where the carrier text contains the actual secret message itself, while the open stego key contains keys that correspond to the messages in the carrier text. Both read naturally, so then the only difficulty relies on the creation, as the user has to manually review each sentence to make sure it's still coherent. Fully automated processes may take some time, but with advances in NLP such as Word2Vec and GPT-3 that are programs that utilize machine learning to generate sentences, the field of steganography and natural language processing could be an interesting route to explore. Finally, there is the application of machine learning in not just the generation of stego objects, but also in detection and in steganalysis. There are studies of using statistical methods to detect the existence of steganography in real time. This particular paper uses both Bayesian estimation and the correlation coefficient to compare two files for a comparison, and seeing if the differences between the text has any indication of a secret message inside of them. Covering the statistics behind the methodology is out of the scope of this presentation, but essentially the experiment yielded higher detection rates but could be improved with better data sets. Naturally, the use of statistics would lend itself well to the field of machine learning and neural networks. So there is a paper that surveys those techniques from the year 2015 and 2018. There, the paper details applications not restricted to steg analysis. The diagram listed here is an example of such a model, which itself is a collection of networks stitched together for the sole purpose of analyzing an image for steganography. I also want to point out that the paper also covers the subfield of selection channel aware steganalysis, which the selection channel concept itself was a contribution of this paper. If you're interested in more topics of steganography, just as how it applies to fields such as hardware, there will be more students covering this topic, so feel free to view the presentation for more in-depth look. This paper was more of a survey than a comprehensive study, so the topics presented in this video is only the breadth of this field. To summarize this presentation, we've covered how steganography conceals the existence of messages. We've covered its theoretical basis, which is described in the prisoner's problem with Alice and Bob communicating against a warden. We've covered various techniques such as LSB for images or masking for audio, and highlighted tools such as Steghide that are modern implementations of these techniques. The core of the paper itself, which is measuring these various limits of steganography, uses entropy and information theory, and we concluded with the various related and future works that are currently in this field. Here is a list of sources used for this presentation. If you go back in the slides, any numbered annotation correlates to the citations listed in the paper itself, while lettered source are references used specifically for this presentation. If you have any further questions, feel free to email me or leave a comment in this video below. Thank you.